This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Cheers, Brilliant. We nearly all hear music in our heads to different extents, both tunes that exist. Thunderbolt and lightning, very, very frightening me. Galileo, 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 Galileo. And tunes that don't. Biscuit moons, gotta love those biscuit moons, gotta love the biscuit moons. For some of us, this music comes forth readily, and for others, it doesn't. Some people can hear the individual instruments of an orchestra in their brains, and others can barely grasp a vague tune. And so brain-held music is a bit of a weird phenomenon really, simultaneously near universal but also super ethereal because we can never know exactly what's going on in someone else's head. Nevertheless, even if you're someone who can't conjure any sort of tune in your mind's ear at all, I'm sure you can imagine how weird it would be if that suddenly changed. If there was a drastic shift in your brain's musical abilities or even your own musical preferences. That is exactly what happened to surgeon Dr. Tony Sicoria in 1994. At 42, he was struck by lightning in his face. It was, of course, during a lightning storm, but actually the bolt that struck him didn't come from the sky, it came from a payphone he'd just finished using. He had a brief out-of-body experience where he saw his own body from above, and also an intense sense of ecstasy filled him as he recalled key moments from his life. But after that, he came to as somebody was giving him CPR. He actually refused to have an ambulance called for him and instead opted to call his own cardiologist. And thank goodness he did, because they offered him this sage advice. Well, with these things, you're either alive or you're dead. And you're alive. Okay. Immediately afterwards, nothing much seemed amiss. Dr. Tony was a little bit sluggish and had a few slight memory problems, but scans were taken of his brain and nothing seemed problematic. Two weeks after the strike, he was back at work, still with some lingering memory issues, but nothing that impacted his work as a surgeon. You know, just little things like forgetting the names of rare diseases or surgical procedures. Not reassuring if you're his patient, but not horrendous. A couple of weeks on from that, so now we're looking at about four weeks in total after the strike, the memory problems subsided. Absolutely sorted. But then, clicked properly, but then <laughs> Dr. Tony developed an insatiable desire to listen to piano music. This was out of character for him, right? He didn't really take much interest in the piano before and he'd always actually preferred rock music. But now he became obsessed with listening to Vladimir Ashkenazi's recordings of Chopin's Winter Wind Etude, Black Key Etude, A-flat Major Polonaise, Military Polonaise, and Spaghetti Polonaise. <laughs> Next came an intense desire not just to listen to piano, but to play piano. Weird, because although he'd had some lessons when he was younger, he had no idea how to play now. So he started learning how to play at the age of 42. And as if those changes weren't enough, things often come in threes and another musical shift was waiting in the wings. After having a dream where he was playing something he'd written, Dr. Tony found his own music started to fill his head. Tunes that he couldn't find recordings of to listen to or buy sheet music to try and learn because he was composing them in his own brain. The music came in a torrent of notes that he needed to give form, pacing and structure to, so now he was finding himself simultaneously having to learn how to play piano, but also trying to learn how to write down the music that was trapped inside his noggin. That's a lot to be dealing with. He became, by his own confession, possessed by music, getting up at 4am, playing the piano till he went to work, doing a surgeon thing, and then coming home and playing obsessively in the evening. He had time for nothing else. Eat, sleep, piano, repeat. Bizarrely, this shift in music tendencies was one of the only long-term major changes noted in Tony after the strike. The other ones were that he found his sense of spirituality was lifted and his interest in the physics of electricity was amped up. After the strike, Dr. Tony got divorced, was in a really extreme motorbike accident that he also miraculously recovered from, and more importantly, in the context of this story, learned to play piano and actually successfully composed his own music. Here he is playing one of his pieces aptly named Lightning Sonata. <laughs> So there we go, that's the story. One lightning strike later and this physician had turned into a musician and also remained a physician. This charming man had become lost in music. What a story, right? And it does beg the question, what went on in his brain to make that shift happen? Well, I read about this story in this book, 
Music Ophelia by Oliver Sacks. I am a huge fan of Sacks' work because he always took a keen interest in individual stories. In science, we understandably need data from big, big groups in order to come to any solid conclusions. Proving a theory is correct or a medicine works is essentially just a numbers game. This means that case studies where the number of people studied is just one aren't really valued and statistically this makes sense but you often find that it's in these n equals one stories where things get really interesting and we can get valuable insights into how our bodies work from them the fact that oliver sacks never forgot about the individual stories and the nuance that existed within each of his patients is something that has always been so inspiring to me and it's something that's so easily overlooked when we translate scientific research with big numbers into interactions with individuals. He's such an inspiration and may he rest in peace. But fangirling over Oliver Sacks aside, the case studies, in other words, the individual stories listed in this book can be really useful because they can help us unpick potentially what was happening in Dr. Tony's brain. Because the brain scans taken after the strike told us basically zilch. And so what we often do when we're a little stumped in science by a particular case is we look at people who've had somewhat similar experiences. Sykes talks a lot about epilepsy in this book and so it's worth taking a moment to mention that epileptic seizures show a lot of variation. The phrase epileptic seizure generally conjures up an image of what we call grand mal seizures. These are the ones where people lose control of their body and shake violently. But epileptic seizures can come in lots of different forms, some of which, for example, from the outside just look a bit like someone's zoning out a bit. There's a huge range of seizure types and levels of intensity. In Musicophilia, here it is again, Sachs writes about various people for whom music is a key part of their seizures. So one example is that there are cases where hearing certain types of music can trigger a seizure. And one well-known example of this was the music critic Nikonov, who, well, his career was ruined when he developed such seizures. Another example is a woman called Sylvia, who had seizures specifically when she heard Neapolitan songs. And no, those aren't songs about tri-flavoured ice cream, genuinely what I thought when I first read it. They're traditional songs from Naples. When those seizures became more severe, occurring even separately from the music, she had part of her temporal lobe chopped out. After that, her musical seizures stopped. What's more similar to Dr. Tony, however, are the examples where hearing music in your head is just a part of the seizure experience. This is seen in some individuals with temporal lobe epilepsy. A case even more similar to that of Dr. Tony's is that of Salima M, a woman who experienced a shift in her feelings towards music. She went from being vaguely interested to being intensely and passionately obsessed. What triggered that shift? Well, it appeared after a tumour was removed from her right temporal lobe. Oops, there it is again. Several case studies in this book point to the connection between our temporal lobes and our experience of music in our brains. It also mentions that in temporal lobe epilepsy at least, brain scans often show that nothing is amiss. But scans were taken of his brain and nothing seemed problematic. Sounds familiar. The temporal lobe emerging as a suspect from case study comparison is not a surprise. We know that it has roles to play in tons of things, including the processing of sound and the emotional emotional processing of sound, and also the emotional processing of smells and sights, if you're interested. The auditory cortex is even part of our temporal lobe, which, if you haven't guessed already, is on the sides of your brain, that's why I'm pointing here. Go through your temples, get to your temporal lobe. So now we know that the temporal lobe is the brain area that most likely holds the key to Dr. Tony's piano love, the next thing is to suss out what might have happened in it. Dr. Tony's initial symptoms, including his memory problems, his confusion and sluggishness, and potentially his out-of-body and near-death experiences also, could be explained by a sudden drop in blood pressure in the brain and the associated lack of oxygen for a minute or two. A surge in certain brain chemicals, such as noradrenaline, may also have had a role to play in those. But in terms of his musicalness, not only is the development of his penchant for Chopin, his penchant, if you will, weird enough, but the delay between the lightning strike and the development of the symptoms makes this whole thing even more bizarre. 
One theory that's been put out there to explain why we sometimes see musical shifts in people is that somehow the connections between the parts of your temporal lobe that perceive things, aka sense and process things like sound, and your systems that deal with emotions become intensified. Perhaps this strengthening of connections is what was happening in Dr. Tony over the four weeks after the lightning strike. Whatever the change that went on in his head, it's safe to say that the scans he got just after the accident weren't enough to tell as much at all. But there are ways we could try and discover a little more. One method is using a science scan, EEG, to monitor him over a period of time. An EEG scan involves putting electrodes on your face and head and then you get a graph that looks a bit like this out of it. Those waves differ in people with epilepsy. And so a test like that could help to tell us if Dr. Tony's musical inspiration is actually epileptic in nature. That's the method suggested by Mabe, Oliver Sacks himself, but I reckon you could also try putting him in another science scan, an fMRI. This is the scan you might have heard a lot about, it's the one where brain areas light up depending on if they're in use or not. There are some doubts as to how consistently valid it is as a method, and Dr. Tony would have to go in a claustrophobic scanner, but you know, if we got an insight into how his brain- No. It's not worth considering any of these methods. Why? Because Dr. Tony doesn't want to know. To him, his love of music came as a lucky strike. He was just so lucky. Lucky, lucky, lucky. It was a blessing, a mystery, something that doesn't need to be questioned. And to be honest, I like that. I think some of the best questions are those that are left unanswered. And so Dr. Tony will remain a single case study that science just doesn't have an answer for. Good on him. I'll tell you what though, if you're anything like me, then you'll be wondering if one day you'll suddenly become enraptured in learning something new. Well, wait no further. Lightning strike effect. Feel that? What's going on? Do you suddenly have the urge to learn some maths and science skills? No way, that's totally weird because I have the perfect place for you to go. That place, of course, is brilliant. An app and a website where you can learn so many things, it'll make your noggin spin. They've got courses on loads of maths and science topics, ranging from introductions on how to think like a scientist to more in-depth topics like what is infinity. You can even learn how to win a car, not a goat, by mastering probability puzzles. You could also learn how to win the goat, if you'd rather win that. <laughs> Scrolling through their website is like being an eager to learn kid in a books made of candy shop. And what's best about their courses is that you learn all of this by completing fun challenges and interactive quizzes. You learn by doing stuff, not by staring at flashcards or sleeping on a textbook. Their courses are enjoyable, educational, and will leave you feeling super satisfied and like you've achieved something. Because you will have achieved something. Knowledge. That's what you will have achieved. So if you want to quell that need to learn which has possessed your brain recently, then you can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash sosnotes. And what is even better is that the first 200 of you to click on that link, which is in my description, will get 20% off your annual premium subscription. Winner. And that's it for now, everyone. If you've made it this far, thank you so much. I appreciate your beautiful watch time so much. If you fancy giving me more things that I appreciate, then why not like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe to my channel if you subscribe it and to me and my ideals, and comment if you have any thoughts. Tell me how well you hear music in your head. It's different for everyone. How is it for you? Also, media my socials if you want to do that. Otherwise, all that's left to say is thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely day, and remember to keep on running. Keep on hiding, yeah. One fine day, I'm gonna be the one. Make you understand. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna be your man. There's nothing like Googling lyrics to check them to make you realise that they're actually kind of creepy. A big thank you to all my patrons with a special welcome science word shout out to Brent, Nudson, and Philip. Hello there, pals. And also little hellos to Adam Dullinger, Terry Cox, and Justin Brown. If I want to do it on this hand, I should get someone else to do it. I could try. Why not? I've been on Mike Boyd's channel, I should I can learn new things. Oh no I can't. Let's do another take, just just in case me eating the biscuit wasn't good enough. Galileo, 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 Galileo. <laughs> Choose your mode. Vain or full of crippling self-doubt. <laughs> okay, great. Biscuit moves. 
And that's the end. Here's a link to another unusual tale of a video. <laughs> here's a link to a playlist of my personal favourites. Here's a cheeky little Patreon link. And here's the word goodbye. Goodbye.